I'm just kind of curious around the topic of content because I think that's one of the things is that a lot of people misunderstand first of all the the benefit of having a, a following but also a more laser targeted following I'm kind of curious about what your thoughts are in terms of creating laser targeted content versus some people out there are always kind of putting out the idea of just post content if you just post 10 times a day you'll get traction so like what are your thoughts on that versus I guess um you know if, if it were a battle firing a, a dozen guns into a battlefield versus the one sniper shot that wins the battle yeah, so there's a, a few layers to that question, uh, and I'm going to answer it specifically from an organic perspective, uh, organic social media content. So we're a huge proponent of quality over quantity. Frequency doesn't really yield the results when we're talking about virality and, and reaching massive growth with audience and, and content. On the same side being super hyper targeted with your content meaning you're creating a piece of content for a specific audience that doesn't work for organic either the reason is the algorithms control reach and distribution of your content they control whether a thousand people see your content or a million people see your content and they only care about one thing and that's user retention meaning the more time people spend on these platforms the more ads they can serve the more profit they generate and because they have billions and billions of content to choose from, they are going to choose content that they can see to the widest possible audience and hold that attention for as long as possible. Uh, the algorithms are not there to suppress your reach on purpose so that you can boost your post and pay for for, for a reach. Uh, because that if that was the case, nobody would ever go viral. Nobody would ever build an audience without using paid ads. With that said, uh, and this is you know one of the core principles that we see people making mistakes with, and one of the core principles that has really shifted with so many content creators on the planet is we call it the generalist principle, is how can you make your subject matter, your message, uh, your business interesting to somebody that may have never heard of you or may not have any interest in you at all, uh, while still subtextually playing to your core audience. So to give you an example, there's a YouTuber named Graham Stephan and he teaches finance to millennials. Now, typically finance is not an interesting subject matter, especially to millennials. So his most viewed video is how I bought a Tesla for $78. So right away, that hook could be interested to anybody. And in that video, he is breaking down finance, but he's breaking it down in the context of this story of how he got this Tesla for $78. So he's still playing to his core principles, He's still playing to his core message. He's not diluting it, but he understands that the algorithms want content that they can see to as many people as possible and uh, connect with that audience. So that video has like seven or eight million views. Now, if he would have said, I'm going to teach you the principles of how to get the most out of your car financing, that video would probably get a thousand views. So if you look at it from the perspective of seven to eight million views, and let's just say maybe only 10% is his core target, or even 1% compared to reaching a thousand people, you significantly beat out your competition. To give you another example, there's a real estate agent named Ryan Serhant that sells prop luxury properties between 10 to $250 million in Manhattan. So his core audience of who buys and works with him from a property standpoint is very small, but he's using these principles by doing things like, let me take you on a tour of a $7 million closet. Let me take you on a two over $250 million ranch. And again, what he's doing is he is playing to that general audience where he's generating millions and millions of views. And he knows he only needs less than 1% to be his core target and he's going to win. And he's going to win in a much bigger way than any other luxury real estate agent out there because the number of potential leads seeing his videos is much higher, but he's also building a massive brand for himself. So that's kind of how we look at it. You know, just to recap, it is quality over quantity, but it's not of you know, a sniper message to a sniper audience because the algorithms aren't going to do that much work for you. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't still work for paid advertising because you have the ability to target, but even in that, you need to be able to really grab and hold attention effectively. And I just see that oftentimes uh, when you're going too niche with your message and your content, uh, it can be a little bit heady for social media platforms because the reality is you're competing against every piece of content out there. Like it or not, you're competing against Netflix. You're competing against LeBron James, ESPN, Kim Kardashian. And your content has to effectively be able to stop, grab that attention and hold that attention long enough to get the point across. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think just piggybacking on that too, because 
I think there's a lot of people who maybe misunderstand the point of why I have a following, because in some ways it might be a vanity thing that, hey, I got a lot of followers, but it's a chance to really leverage that audience. And just to kind of set that up, um, I, I got a friend of mine who built 5 million followers on Instagram through doing contests. And he was really proud of himself for doing that. But when it came to actually presenting a, a way to convert those uh, followers into customers, nobody wanted to buy because nobody was invested in him. They just were following him for the sake of getting free stuff. So I'm kind of curious for you um, what your thoughts are on the benefit of having a following. Obviously, it creates an audience that you can connect, connect with and hopefully that leads to consulting, things like that versus let's just say people saying, well, instead of buying ads, I'll, as a, an example, um, I'll just go and buy followers because that way I'll get my you know, mass amount of following that doesn't actually resonate or do anything for me. If anything, it's more damaging than anything. Yeah, well, let, let's start with that example. I, I think the primary issue that your friend ran into, because out of 5 million people, there's definitely going to be people in there that can buy his products or services. The issue that he probably ran into is his content wasn't dialed in. Because when you grow an audience that way, and I'm not diluting growing your audience in that way, we've tested those principles that can be used for certain things. Uh, to, to drive uh, value. But if you don't know how to create content that, again, plays to what the algorithms are looking for, you could have 5 million people and reach 30,000 of them. So you're not maximizing the value versus when you have your content dialed in, if you can reach 500,000 to a million of those people, I'm sure your friend probably would have had more success um, with that. You know, we have those contacts. We know those people that do contests, giveaways, and things like that. I typically never recommend that until you have your content dialed in because of that reason. But by the time you have your content dialed in, then you don't really need that that element. But to the true intent of your question, uh, sure, it can drive benefit from having validation and credibility around getting speaking engagements, podcasts, press, or even potential customers that you're seeing on paid ads or customers hearing you on a podcast or something checking out your profile and seeing a big number next to your name. I don't believe in being buying fake followers. You know, that that's just just you know misleading. You want to have real people associated um with your account, but the number next to your name is all about how you leverage it. And again, the number next to your name doesn't really mean a lot if you're not an effective content creator, an effective communicator uh on these platforms. Yeah, that makes total sense. And thanks for elaborating. You talk a lot about the concept of a discomfortable idea. Uh, and I was kind of curious if you could give a bit of advice on how to get a winning idea and more importantly, how to execute on that as well. It comes to identifying patterns and be able to break those patterns. Any subject matter can go viral. Insurance goes viral, finance goes viral, real estate, medical. It's not about the content, it's about the context. And what I mean by context is how are you positioning your story? How are you telling your story? And that that plays into the generalist principle. Uh, so with Graham Stephan, how I bought a Tesla for $78, that is completely different than anybody in the finance space talking about finance. And it's very successful because it's breaking the pattern. Nobody really logs into YouTube that says, I want to watch finance videos. But I would be interested to see how somebody bought a Tesla for $78. So it's, it's really understanding that your subject matter has probably been talked about thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times. And if you come off like you are going to say the same thing that they've already heard, even though you may have a different perspective, the minute somebody sees a video with a headline, a thumbnail, a meme card, a caption, and they think they know what the video is going to be about, nine times out of 10, they're going to skip it. So it's your job to figure out how to really stand out against all of the content that they've consumed on that subject matter. But as we talked about earlier, it's even more important. How can you stand out with people that may have no interest in your subject matter or have never really uh, heard of you, heard of your product, heard of your business? Yeah, uh, that's great. And do you think that creating curiosity is a strong trigger versus let's, as you pointed out, like looking at a video, it kind of summarizes what the video is about too much where you kind of get the gist and you can move away from it. Or what do you think are some of the strongest triggers to get people to, whether it is click or convert or, you know, follow through with what you're putting out there? 
Well, you, you do want to set a clear expectation of what somebody can expect in watching that video. But as I mentioned, the context of how you do that, do that dictates whether somebody's going to click and watch it. Because uh, again, how I bought a Tesla for $78, he's still delivering on his expertise, his message and service, but he's doing it in a way he's setting an expectation that this is going to be a fun video. This is going to be interesting. And it's going to be something you probably never heard or seen before. So he's setting that expectation up front versus, you know, I'm going to show you how I maximize the most out of car financing to get the best deal. Like, I'm not saying nobody's going to watch that, but most people may say, I'm not interested in that. I don't have the time or energy. I'm on social media because I want an escape or they're going to be like, oh, I already know these, these principles and, and move on. No, that makes absolute sense. I'm curious too, and I apologize if this is a bit too broad, but could you give us some examples of what would be shareable content versus what typically everyone else tends to post out there? Well, from a shareability standpoint, we have like 50 different performance indicators we look at from virality. And it's again, it's all context. And what context means is things like pacing, editing, um, first three seconds, captions, title cards. It's not really the content, it's the context of how you're sharing that. Uh, and you know, one of the big things that we talk about is effect on viewer is what is the effect that you're having on the viewer in them watching the content? And I think that that so many people fail to kind of think about that when they're creating a piece of content and sitting back and you know saying and thinking, like, what what is the effect that I want somebody to have when they view this content? Do I want them to be fascinated? Do I want them to be happy? Do I want them to be sad? Do I want them to be laughing? Uh, those key emotions and that effect that it has on them significantly increases the potential of somebody sharing that content. Content doesn't get shared if there's no effect on the viewer. Like you're not going to talk about a piece of content or, 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 or any piece of media that you watch if it doesn't have some type of effect on you. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And again, that's why fear and anger seem to be the ones that people respond to the most. I would say it doesn't have to be fear and anger. I mean, we see so many positive, like there's mm -hmm. there's a clinical psychologist, Dr. Julie Smith, that's super viral on TikTok. There is a lawyer, uh, Erica Kohlberg, that breaks down like uh, legal fine print around like air, airplane tickets and, you know, what happens when your AirPods break and things like that. Uh, there's uh, the Dodo that's all about inspirational stories around pets. Uh, I would say Grand Stefan is positive. Jay Shetty is amazing. Prince EA. So people often say, and I'm not saying fear and negative content doesn't work on social media, but I think people oftentimes use that as a default and don't kind of really look at the larger landscape of what's happening. Look at Mr. Beast. You know, he's the biggest influencer on the planet, and that's all positive based content. So, uh, and we typically never recommend with our clients to you use fear or anger uh, because it just doesn't really yield the results that yeah. you're looking for. I, I, I can't really think of sitting down and thinking how to um, make people panic and <laughs> run around, um, you know, either angry or yeah, in, in fear. It's, it's not really a, a positive, healthy thing to, to put out there. But I guess like, what would you find is some common traits that most pe people have that have built a successful brand? Well, the first one is the generalist principle is making their content, uh, their message digestible for the widest possible audience. A big challenge that people face where others succeed is really the pacing of it. I think oftentimes, especially in the first few seconds, they overwhelm the viewer. They have a meme card, they're talking, they have captions, they're moving. And there's really, you know, from a subconscious level, we need to have a visual hierarchy of like what we need to focus on and what priority. So I think, you know, setting a clear expectation those first three seconds from a generalist principle, but also not overwhelming the person because if they overwhelm them subconsciously, you feel like you're being left behind and thus you're gonna scroll to the next piece of content. I would say that's a, a another uh, big one is the, the pacing, the pacing of it. That's, that's really cool. 